here in South Carolina and the Netherlands. The radio host, Karen Newman, of About Oneness, a weekly radio show, is about celebrating the ongoing conscious awakening of our planet and our realization of oneness. Karen is an integrated, Reiki master, and metaphysical teacher. She has varied and diverse background, including that of being a singer, a dancer, and a writer, as well as working in the sport, nutrition, and fitness world. As a channel, she brings forward the teachings and knowledge of her non-physical guides called Theos. The teachings of Theos bring forth messages of oneness and unconditional love. The show features discussions, channeled readings, and study. The purpose is to expand the awareness of our truest selves and tapping into the truths of the universe. Your host, may I present, Karen Newman. Oh, yeah. Bob Charles. Oh, yeah. How are you? Okie dokie. Let me just bring this down here a little bit. Yeah. Am I loud? Am I quiet? Am I, okay. am I here? I hear you. <laughs> That's awesome. I hear That's you. Awesome. No problem. Well, how are you? How the hell has everything been since the last time I talked to you? Sweating to death. <laughs> it, it is hot. Holy it mackerel. Is, I, I'm telling it, you, it's 90, it was 97 today, and it makes wow. over 100 by Friday. <gasps> well, let me tell you, it is not that cold. I mean, not that warm here. I had on my winter coat, actually, tonight when I went to walk the dog. Oh, before. my goodness. Can you imagine? I was thinking to myself that I have yet to actually turn on a fan or anything. It hasn't been warm at all. I've opened one window just to get some breeze the other day. It felt a little bit warm, but I don't know. You're you're you're, you're hogging all the summer, Bob. I you know to tell you the truth, I, I should send you some. I mean, you know, get, will it fit in an envelope? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'll get a jar. You know, I'll just like go out and ca- capture this stuff. I mean, it was unbelievable. I went out, I swear to you, I went outside, you know, I walked the dog at 4 o'clock in the morning. So it's yeah, nice out, and I'm looking at the stars and the moon and the, the whole nine yards, right? So, okay, I'm out there, and I'm doing my num yo ho going down the street, and I'm sweating. It's 83 degrees, and it's totally oh. blacked out. Oh. Yeah, not here. Not, not here at all. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So... I have a very interesting guest, uh, someone I've, I've known for a while, and um, but I haven't had him on the show. It's his name is Max Steinberg. He is one of the founders of Human Colony, and we've had quite a few people um, that are involved with Human Colony. Human Colony dot um, org. Dot com, oh, dot org. Sorry, dot org. Mm. Excuse me. Human Colony dot org, and. Max is a Reiki master. He's a channel. He's a metaphysical teacher. Just like he basically is, he's everything. He is. He's provided a platform for many channelers to learn how to channel for messages coming from our extraterrestrial friends, from you know, from outside to us. And he helps other people just find their way spiritually. So he's here to talk with us today, and I'd like to welcome him to the show. Hi, Max. How are you? Hi, uh, everybody. Thank you for having me. Oh, well, welcome. So, Max, for the people who don't know you, why don't you just take a moment and introduce yourself and talk about your background and how you really got started in with Human Colony and also on your own spiritual path? Oh, a big question. All right. Um, yes. Well, um, I you think, have I to think say every... Yeah, one, yeah. Just to highlight. One thing just at a time, highlight. yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, when I was, I think, 16, I remember myself going down the hill on my home street in Moscow, and uh, and I remember looking at the stars and choosing. I consciously chose to be from Pleiades. That was a conscious decision, not a discovery, not observation, but, you know, how about I will be from Pleiades? And it felt good. I, they kind of twinkled very nicely. And uh, skipping many years, um, I guess... There was a day after birth, on every birthday I have a depression. Uh, like, you know, why do I have this birthday present and why am I so sad, right? And right after the birthday, 
Mm, I finished the book, uh, reading the book The Field by uh, Lynn McTaggart. The Field. Uh, my favorite book. I recommend it. Rec- recommend everyone this book. And I finished the book and it opened a lot of things about quantum physics, remote viewing, everything except extraterrestrials. And then I thought, mm, how about I just Google extraterrestrials? It makes perfect logical sense. Let's just do a little research. And I started doing that and um, I never stopped. And that was uh, 2009. So these are highlights. <laughs> So, well, I have a question because you are you are Russian. You are living in the U.S. at the moment, but right. you know, because a lot of people and and you we're lucky because you're speaking English. But how is? I, I understand that in Russia there's a much different view for a lot of people on uh, extraterrestrials versus what we know in the West. At least that's the impression I've had. What is the what is the differences and how do the Russian people view uh, the whole idea of spirituality and, you know, extraterrestrials versus the way we think about them in the West? Right. Yeah, that's a big question. And I'm not actually a good expert on that anymore. Um, when I left in 96, 20 years ago, I don't think extraterrestrials were big in uh, popular mind. There was too many other things that were concerning people. So I think because government hid it and because in, in Russia government is not very good in hiding things. Uh, they're kind of sloppy. Things leaked out. So I remember, uh, you know, we had this wonderful uh, underground press, which is basically copying machines, which were rare, and homemade photography. So you just photograph and make, make at home copies of things. So I remember circulating uh, reports, ufology reports, which of, of course were like secret, prohibited, and everybody have the, had them because they were like so prohibited. That was kind of a, a mood in Russia. So I think people suspected, and there were some landings, some histories, and actually Russian science fiction scientists, uh, science fiction writers were really good like opening up things. So people were prepared. And especially military, I think they had very good uh, background information. So among the military, some group of people distributed the documents which described extraterrestrials pretty well. So I think there is a general understanding that, you know, it's real, but it's kind of distant. People are not fully into that, especially now. But there is tons of programs, and I think they're decent. They're decent. There is tons of uh, television programs, and there is a nice layer of light workers who know everything, who are who read English, listen English, and who are connected, and there is a lot of translation happening. So, so I think there there is a layer, but it's it's much more I would say even more diversified than here, even more diversified. So there are people who are in the team, and there is. You know, most of my Russian friends, they're completely blocked. They they just, you know, their eyes become blank when you talk about that. And then they kind of, uh, when you start trying to say about that second time, they would kind of block you. They would say, don't, don't. I don't want to hear about it. Yeah, Max. So that, that's, that's usual, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, because you have, you ha- why don't you talk about, uh, because... You are the founder of Human Colony together with right. uh, Jim Charles. Why don't you talk about how that really started? Because we've had Jim on the show a couple of times. And, uh-huh. you know, Bob, Jim, is, Jim was doing his first channelings with Max. It was during their Reiki sessions that Max, uh, that, excuse me, that Jim really started channeling. But it really started this sort of connection with uh, the ETs that Max has and that Jim has, and it would be very interesting to hear it from your perspective, Max, on how it happened, because we've heard it from Jim's side. Mm -hmm. So why don't you take it away? All right. Thank you. So for me and for Jim, it was uh, Reiki energy healing, which opened us up to to that idea. So uh, we both have the same uh, Reiki teacher, Barbara Carlton, in Rochester, upstate New York. And um, there, there is a wonderful community. I would say Rochester is the capital of Reiki, actually. It's, um, 
it's a very tight community, and there are centers where people come together for Reiki share, where there is like four tables uh, in, uh, in one big room, and uh, people just work on each other taking turns. So in this group setting, there is the spirit is very high, and miracles happen all the time. And there I met Jim, and Jim impressed me as a very naive person. Uh, I couldn't believe he was that naive. I was thinking he is just, you know, making it up. He is not that, you know, it cannot be that direct, that uh, forward going, that nice. But he was just talking, um, you know, as he thinks and as he prays and what he feels. And that was interesting. And I was kind of a little bit hesitant. But, you know, maybe after a couple times I started trusting him because his Reiki was extraordinary. His energy was very healing, very powerful. And when he said that, um, he asked if I know there are extra t beings around. I said, of course, because you know other people told me that before. And he said, you know, they are likely to be extraterrestrials. And I said, yeah, sure, I know, I know that because other people told me before. I invited them basically. Um, I, I invited them. I wrote a book about extra extraterrestrials, so there was a conscious, in my prayers I invited him, I wanted the contact and and then he, when he did Reiki uh, he said, you know, they want to talk to you and I said, of course and then they said, hi, um, it was Dizdu, and he introduced himself Diz Yakabu Dizdu Dao something of that sort I'm, I asked so many times, so I'm pretty sure I'm saying it correctly, translated to English, to human and uh, it is a tall gray of Yael race. And he said he follows me for several years, and they want to talk to me. And I was ready for that, basically. I was ready. I wanted that. And from my book, from my research of channelings and other ufology readings, uh, reading the books, I knew that there is a nice, big bureaucracy system up there. So the first thing I said... Thank you. I'm honored for your connection and I'm applying for, for a visit to your ship. You, know, you have to apply and then they make the decision. I know that for sure. And um, he said, yes, uh, it is a possibility, uh, but we need to test if you're compatible with, uh, with that kind of travel. And I said, I give my permission. Again, it had to be formal. And um, it was about it, about the first contact. And and Jim and I remember one detail different. I remember that being in their Reiki share room in the presence of other people. And he remembers them to be at home, not in the presence of other people. And they don't have any record. But for next uh, next many sessions, I installed a recording application on my phone. So I have all of that recorded. And we published most of that. Most most of the things which are not personal, we published on, on YouTube. And then we switched from... Um, audio recording to video recording. So we recorded the sessions. It was still mostly in Reiki, but not only. Like, you know, we still had channels in the kitchen, wherever. And we had a nice conversation. Um, so that's how it started. And I was very hungry. I mean, having your own channeler and speaking to different races and trying to find, you know, what is what is the story answer to many questions which arise, like what's their agenda, what do they want, are they good, and you know, how much of power do they have, all of that, it was very interesting. And in the very beginning, I started to understand that the aliens that speak to us, these were um, Yael, which are also called Tall Greys, um, a sort of Tall Greys, one of the races of Tall Greys. Um, Pleiadians, tall Pleiadians, uh, short Pleiadians, which uh, I don't, I never heard about them from others, but but they say that they're known as blues, the short Pleiadians, short, like more like rounded Pleiadians, and um, Assyrian, and and angels and Elyran. These are main main uh, races we talks we spoke to. And obviously I asked many practical questions. I want immediate action. I wanted like to do something right away, the contact right away. Uh, you know, take us now. And obviously, like I don't know if you dreamed about that, but for me it was obvious that, you know, why don't we just go up there to their ships and start working from there? 
I, I knew from the literature and from YouTube that other people have visited them, and there are some humans that work with them, like up there, off planet. And so I wanted to be one off planet, but they mentioned right away that usually you have to, like, uh, how do you say it in English, uh, abandon your human life, earthly life. And I wasn't mm. sure I wanted to do that. I wanted to come back, you know, my friends and family, all of that. But basically, it's, it's a, you know, because I asked that question, uh, and they said they will have to consider it, I, like, I had to decide whether I want to go there forever, possibly forever, mm. over a big period of time. And would I go without the family, or maybe they can take my family, and maybe I can take a few friends, and maybe we would have access to human email and internet, and that would be not, <laughs> not that bad, right? Just being there on the ship yeah. and like working from there, right? And maybe have a, having a secret visit somewhere a little bit. So I was dreaming about that, but that is a tough decision. Would you be able to go? And you know, I, I decided, it took me maybe a whole day to think, and I decided if they take the family, I go. If they don't, I yeah, uh, I can decide. It's 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 tough to decide. So, and now if I take the family, so the kids would grow up without um, human friends. That would be kind of unhealthy. First of all, it would be unhealthy, right? So how about we take more volunteers there and make a working team up there? And how do do you call this? And the name came up, Human Colony. It's a little bit pompous, a little bit overstatement, because it's not actually a colony. It's more like a settlement, a little settlement up there somewhere, uh, using their resources, their supervision, and so on. I don't think they would give us independence right away, right? So, but the idea of Human Colony kind of came up, and then uh, I asked if, you know, if we could invite other people for the visits, and they said, sure. So Takur, Takur is our leader and friend. She gave her personal support to that. She said, I'm inviting. And that was the start of that community. I posted it everywhere. And uh, the main, uh, main place where from we got the people coming, so I started the site, humancolony.org. And I posted everywhere that invitation so you can apply for a visit to the ship apply. It's not guaranteed that you will be taken, but you can apply. And uh, lots of people responded, like first days, it was like first two days, maybe maybe 100 people or something like that. Later, it kind of faded a little bit, but but first first impact was pretty, pretty good. And I created, no, and then I asked my alien friends if um, they can read email, if I create a, an, a, an email box for them, like Gmail box. I would they be able to receive email? So if people apply by email, would it be read by the alien? They say, sure, our technology allows that. So I created the email. It's still working. Mailbox, sign up to go at gmail.com. Sign up to go at gmail.com. That's simple. One word, sign up to go. And you can write to that email anything you want. And uh, they seem to be reading it. They seem to be reading it. I have some proof now about proofs. I have some proof that they are reading it. Not very well, not very, how do you say, not very quickly and not very, they don't, you know, if, if you ask them by channel, I wrote to you like yesterday, did you check my email? I say, they usually say, can you please repeat the question? Because maybe, we, maybe I read, but I don't remember. So it would be nice to have that kind of prove the miracle that you send a mail to some mailbox and then aliens then through channel and say, yeah, yeah, we received it. It never happened. It never happened. They don't give you that proof. You know, it's nice to have that. Anyway, so, and then for people, so now the audience, everybody, if you want to be taken by our alien friends to the ship for a visit, not forever, for a visit, um, you send your email to sign up to go at gmail.com in free form. You can it can be many pages, it can be one word, it can be sent many sentences. But basically, introduce yourself, explain why why do you want to go, how can you contribute to what they do, and um, you will be considered. Uh, and for those people who are afraid, there is not that many people who are afraid, but some people would like to go, but they don't want to send email as a proof that they're interested. 
I created a web form which is anonymous. So on the website, you can type in, I want to go, and if you type it from the library computer, nobody can trace you except our extraterrestrial friends. So that is also an opportunity. So it doesn't really matter if you send it from your email or if you give your home address or you just uh, type it on the f anonymous form. That is sufficient. And then people started applying and started joining us our site. And many people reported that right the night after they applied, they got so-called interview or so-called visit. Usually it is very much like a spirit, spiritual experience. It's more like a holographic spiritual experience. You wake up in the night and someone very nice and friendly chats with you. And some people said, I chatted with him the whole night and only in the morning I understood it was interview in response to my application. But that was reported many times. You know, out of a few hundred people who were who are our members, you know, many, many people reported that interview. And then some people, much fewer people, remember visiting the colonies and being, you know, visiting constantly that, that, that colony. And their descriptions are kind of vague. You know, when I remember my visits of the colony, it's more like a, a dream. And then, you know, I, we, we compare notes and other people also have dreams and sometimes we see each other in a dream, that kind of so it's not very, I would say, not very material experience. It's still more like a, a spiritual experience. So, so your visits have all, have all been, say, in your sleep time and not have been in your conscious wake time then. Right, right, right. yes. But do you, you do have memories of being there? I mean, do you have, is it sort of when you're there, do you, pick up in your experience where you left off? Is it a totally different experience? Does it always look the same? I mean, what is your, what is your actual experience of being there? Um, all right. My experience is so vague. It's, 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 I have other profound experiences. Maybe it's three or four or five or six. Very few. Sufficient to know it's real, but very few. But uh, memories of, of visits to the colonies are very vague. Like at some point, I remember uh, several, maybe many dreams, maybe seven or more dreams where I hold my extraterrestrial child, um, like baby or bigger child. So, so I ha we have hybrid children up there, right? And memories of these children kind of flush maybe a second, and I wake up, basically. I'm so excited I wake up from that. And I remember holding a baby, and I remember feeling that I love that baby. So so that 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 is my, my main memories. And, and then I kind of try to confirm it through channeling, and, you know, it's all this kind of, not a full confirmation. They give you the answer, but it's, they're kind of, it's, it's rare that they give you a miracle. I got many miracles, but you know it's it's rare. Like in many many conversations, sometimes a miracle happens. Like uh, one of the latest miracles was um, in two channelings. I just you know happened to have them side by side, one after another. I had a very innocent question. I just ran out of books to read, and I said, you know, which book would you recommend me to read? So two different unrelated channelers gave me the same book to read. That was wonderful. And that was a profound book as well. Oh, that's good. So, so what do you think the purpose is of not being able to remember? I mean, if if we you've requested these experiences, you've requested the ability to go. They've said to you, are giving you the information that you could bring people and and go. What's the purpose of not remembering? And why why don't you remember? Right. Um, great question. I was stumbling at this question for for a long time. We started about three years ago, and at a year year and a half from the beginning, I had a major crisis of mistrust. I just, you know, it just did make sense, right? Um, 
because you know they're saying they're capable of many things and i know for sure from ufo literature from youtube from crop circles that there is a lot of extraterrestrial activity where they really can do physical things you know i interviewed uh people who have gone there and have memories of their ships not from our colony so so i know people who constantly have be visiting the ships like through their lifetime and have lots of proof and um, one person lived several years in his childhood in the uh, on the alien planet so I have that on my uh, YouTube channel um, and it's all, all, all kind of these interviews are documented so so I have proof that you know other people experience physical stuff and here my best friends extraterrestrials just don't provide me any any proof that they're real they were like you know my my suspicion was are they maybe spirits who pretend to be extraterrestrials and they say something which is actually not not real and i had a major crisis like fall out of the whole idea i was kind of you know this extraterrestrial idea is doesn't seem to be real from our material measurements and it was a major depression and crisis for me like, how do you live with it but even I kind of had, was, had suspicions about them, I didn't have any suspicions of the channelers. The channelers are real. They are not making it up. And I didn't have any suspicions of the spirits. I, I had very good understanding that the spirit is real. The spiritual experiences are real. Only that we can't really remember the visits to the colonies and we can't really ask them to do something physical for us. That was, you know, I demanded some some physical proof and they just you know they just didn't understand you know we are not in a position to demand okay so my and after that I kind of made peace with that and making peace with that was through understanding that they are not from this world they are not from this dimension they are not extraterrestrial they are actually extra dimensionals and when they jump from one dimension to another when they talk through a channel from one dimension to another, it is it is a pretty big jump. And whatever happens up there, or when we travel transdimensionally, um, it's it's it doesn't follow the rules of of our material reality. The causation, the causation, the cause effects relationship just doesn't work. You can't ask for for proofs in that because you know even they were surprised. We don't remember. Like they said, we are investigating and we don't understand. From their perspective, we should remember the visits, and we don't. And some people, you know, it's funny, some people remember, uh, wake up with a uh, muscle pain from, uh, like, physical workout, and then when they have a channeling, they get a confirmation that they were at uh, the colony and they had physical workout. So you remember fi some physical experiences, but you don't, actually, you feel experiment experiences, but you don't remember them. So now I, uh, my my explanation is that just that dimensional jump is is the cause of not remembering this. We are take a breath. We are in a, in a, an illusion, illusionary reality. It, our reality is a, is a big illusion, and one of the main rules of this illusion is that it's self perpetuating, it's self sustaining. So when we do this dimensional jumps. They're permitted, except that the memories, if you would bring back the memories, they would destroy this illusion. And this, I think it's self-protection of the matrix, which doesn't permit us to bring back the memories. It's just too much for, if, like, we are a very open colony. We are chatting online. We are sharing the experiences online. So if that many people few hundred people who visit the colonies would come back and you know start sharing their experiences that would be explosion right you know if we had exact memory of the proof that we have been there and you know transfer their their password or pass code and then some other person would bring back the passcode and say confirm yes that, that's real that would be like shaking the foundations of that illusion and I, I agree with you. I think that was very brilliantly said, actually. That was quite profound what you said, that, that the 
illusion that we are living in, this third dimensional world is a self-perpetuating illusion. And if, if too many people come back with that different idea, it will shatter this, this reality. I think that that is actually quite profound what you said just there. And I, and it rings very true to my feeling. And, you know, we have to remember that we on some level have also chosen to be here to experience this, to buy into this, uh, this illusion, this matrix illusion. And so there's that part of our unconsciousness too, that knows that if we brought it forward, it would shatter it. Because I, I think that of everything you said, I think that's, <laughs> that's a very, very profound statement that you've made. And I think that's actually the key to it, that if so many people all of a sudden, and that's part of that shift that's happening, is more people are starting to wake up. And when we reach that critical mass, it will just all fall away. But if it all falls away, then it may or may not exist at all. And, you know, that's something else. Do we Do we want to transform it or do we want to shatter it? Absolutely, yes. Thank you for understanding, yeah. Um, yeah. One of the questions I constantly ask when I talk to them and to the spirits is how many timelines are there when mm. you extraterrestrial, like say this do, uh, the tall gray this do, the commander of the ship uh, on the Earth's orbit, I, I, I say uh, to, how many uh, timelines our timelines, earthly timelines, do you communicate with constantly? And he says, I don't remember exact number, but it was between 7 and 10. Mm. So it's for them, Max coming from this timeline and someone else coming from other timeline, you know, it's all, they all come to the same colony, as I understand, which is even crazier. Like, we have parallel timelines. Mm. And, and that even complicates that idea of illusion even more. Um, and I asked the angels about that question and other extraterrestrials, and most of them work with multiple timelines, multiple timelines. But I, I asked, you know, how many maxes do you, how many me do you communicate? And they said just one, just one from this timeline. You don't, they don't, so in other timeline, there is no max creating human colony. There is something else. Okay. Yeah, it's very, you know, we are, we're multidimensional beings, and that's also something very interesting. To That's an actual other, you know, it's like a wrench in the works as well. That's just another thing. But who is it that you communicate with the most? Because you have your own connections. I know Jim, you know, Jim channels to Kerr and a bunch of other different beings, as well as just, you know, just, any, anybody that seems to be flying by, Jim can sort of tap into. But who do you actually work with the most as far as the beings that you're most connected to? Oh, um, as a channeler, I am a beginner. I don't really understand much. I invite different energies. They come, but the information that comes is kind of not that discreet as with Jim. So I use other channelers. I'm more like the one who asks questions rather than the one mm -hmm. who who delivers the message. Um, as a channeler, I, I'm teaching channeling because, because I have the talent of teaching. And teaching something and doing something is not exactly the same. I'm more like teaching people to channel because I'm struggling with that and learn all the techniques, techniques mm -hmm. of channeling, how you get there. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a wonderful uh, anime series, The Legend of Korra. Have you watched The Legend of Korra? No, I haven't, but I, I've heard of I it. I recommend highly. Uh, so okay. there, I think maybe season two or three, uh, there is a, an experienced teacher of Air Tribe, the leader of Air Tribe, of mystical people who meditates every day and and people would think that he would guide the avatar to the spirit world and he said I actually never been to the spirit world so what did you do all, all this in all this meeting I was trying to get there so so you know I, I just recognize myself in, in, in this uh, Kenjin he was um, 
you know, same thing. I'm trying to get there. I get lots of proofs and experiences, but I'm not like like Jim, not not that easy. He would just get messages, even not without going into trance. He would get messages right <laughs> away and very yeah. discreet, very precise. I yeah. I get answers. If I have a question, I get answers. Uh, when I was in um, high school, it was a mathematical boot, boot camp in Russia. Like, you know, as a Jewish kid, I, you know, I just found it. I was very happy. And my kids also love mathematics. So I, I went to this special school. And there I, I excelled because I could get into a kind of semi-trance state and get the answer without thinking. Basically, I would just touch my head uh, to the right of the right brow. And, um, and um, I would get into this state and I would get the answer and then I would just translate the answer for the teacher in a way the teacher would expect it so they would understand but but that that is like I use the whole life so I'm I'm kind of psychic but some things are just still beyond the veil for me so who I'm talking to I I'm I'm not very sure I have when I meditate I see the light of different shapes and the buzz of different vibrations but that's about it and then some some other people explain to me who these are. But there is a trick, basically, if I invite someone and the answer is quick, like I invite Metatron, Archangel Metatron, and the answer is quick, I think that's Metatron is coming. And I say thanks to Metatron. So that is the answer who I'm working with. So my favorite, after I had this crisis with extraterrestrials, I, I went to angels. Angels never failed me. Angels... Unlike extraterrestrials, the angels are native here. They are uh, specialists in uh, helping humans. So they are a different life form. Uh, They are created by the creator. They are not evolving. They are not given birth and evolving as humans and extraterrestrials. They are not evolutionary developing life form. They are being created. And they work as, as supporters of this illusion, of the as the as many other interdimensional beings like elementals, gnomes, fairies. Uh, but the angels are very important figures. They are messengers of God. They deliver the messages, and they can change the reality in very profound ways using their prayers, their special angelic language. And my main um, analogy is that they are like system administrators. Uh, when your net- network or when your computers are not working, you call for a system administrator and they have special passwords, special u- utilities to to bring it back, restore from backup and things of that sort. So to me, it's a great analogy that angels do about the same service. They have personalities. They are individuals. They have individual consciousnesses. Right. And uh, I love them. They just help me so much. And they can answer many questions which extraterrestrials are not, per- are not permitted to answer. And the angels are permitted to intervene when the spiritual reason is appropriate. They can heal or intervene or change the reality. So praying to angels just empirically was found to be much more practical than asking extraterrestrials. That, that's, <laughs> that is my... I understand. Uh, I, love that and I love that idea that there are system administrators and that they have special passwords because that's, that's actually... The computer analogy makes a lot of sense. And they can go in and they can restore from backup. They can do healings. They can do all kinds of stuff. There's a great book you should read called Ask Your Angels. Um, I'll uh-huh. look it up and I'll tell you. But it's a woman who wrote this book and she wanted to get stuff done in her life and she got the idea that she should have the ability to delegate all of her things that she needed done to the angels. So she would sit down and she would have like a business meeting and actually assign different tasks to different angels and just check back with them and ask how things are being done. And once she started actually letting go a lot of this stuff and giving it over, she started to really have things start moving and start happening in her life. And she wrote a whole book about it called Ask Your Angels. And I'll, I'll look it up and uh, let you know what it is. But it, it's, it's actually a fascinating book. It's an interesting idea. 
and it's it's really fun, but at the same time, it's exactly in line with what you were saying. So maybe that's a good book for you to uh, thank to you. Check. Yeah, I'll look right. it up for here, you. Here is a split in logical consequence. So uh, one questions I want I, you you mentioned is uh, computer analogy. Let, let's develop this this branch. So so as I understand. Uh, human spirits as a human collective, global, whatever, many billion of human spirits, uh, playing this computer game which is called um, the Earth reality, right? And on different servers there are different computer versions of this game and that would correspond to different timelines. Same game, just different servers run a little differently. Now, um, the aliens run their program in a different, not only different server, it's a different uh, principles of the design of the world, different dimension. And uh, usually we call our dimension third and their dimension fourth, although the numbers vary from channeling to channeling. Sometimes it's fifth, sometimes it's ninth, so, so it can be different. But basically one dimension up from us. So they run a very different program. And... Here is the idea of ascension. Ascension essentially is an upgrade of the software. So when the whole game reached some level of uh, complexity, level of understanding, level of lessons, level of lessons in the game, it is eligible, eligible for the upgrade. So humanity is sort of eligible, but of the consensus of, of humans is not ready. So basically when they vote, there is so many spirits which still want to play the old game and so few spirits who want to play the new game that the upgrade cannot happen. So that ascension is happening and all my sources basically agree that it will take about five generations, maybe 100, 100 to 150 years to to shift to this new reality, and then we will be upgraded to the fourth dimension. The property of this fourth dimension, they describe it in a very funny way. Uh, basically, it's all, all the same, except everyone is telepathic, everyone is psychic, and, um, and tele, tele, telekinetic, I would say, and also the, I don't remember how you call it when you go through the walls, you can shift through, through places, and maybe sometimes you can shift from one place to another. So, teleportations, so all tele, many teleproperties. All the tele, tele, yeah. yeah, all the tele, it's telepathic, telekinetic, teleportation, tele, uh, others. So, um, and what I found fascinating is that they don't forget their past lives. When they are born, it really depends on the race, but they can remember their past lives. And that makes you much less afraid of death and much more wise in your life. So you are born an old man, basically. Not that your brain, maybe maybe small brain, cannot, cannot handle all the responsibility, but as you grow up, you kind of rem- remember everything that in the past life. And among humans, only few humans remember past lives. So, so that's, you know, that makes them very different. Now, telepathy is the key for them. So they say they will shift, we will shift, the humanity will shift when a certain percent of humans become telepathic. And as I understand, it makes the uh, the system more connected. We are now becoming more connected. We are talking through the distance, right? We are already connected electronically, te- technologically. But when you become telepathic, you the the amount of information and the quality of information becomes much more dense. So you would connect in a much more truthful way. So deception becomes less possible. And, uh, and that changes the vibration of the whole system. When the whole system is much more interconnected, then it is gradiating to the next dimension. Then the shift happens. Uh, so that's basically... Uh, well, I agree with you about the thing about how long it's going to take. We've had many discussions about this shift in ascension. And at one moment, I think I said something like it's going to take a hundred and some odd years. And 
And I had a woman write me a letter, angry. <laughs> she was mad that I said it was going to take so long um, because she's like, we need these changes now. And I said, yes, but it's not an, you know, it's not an end. It's just a shift. So the process of shifting is, is kind of exciting to th- see things transforming, to see people opening up to new ideas. But it, I think you're right. If you're going back to what you said originally, which was very profound, if too many people just come in with this new idea, it will shatter this reality. And that's not what we want to do. We want to transform it. We want to evolve in it. And we've all decided to be part of this shift. So it'll be really interesting to see how things come out. What is it that's your biggest question still? What are you, because you said you're really good with the questions. What is it that you are asking? What are questions are you co- consciously working on right now for yourself? Um, yeah, one of the questions is personal ascension, right? So you can ascend as a species, but you can also shift to the higher dimension personally. So, so that's what we actually are, are doing. The light workers, we spend a lot of time meditating, going up dimension, connecting the dimensions, and bringing some answers back and and uh, connecting here. So that's that's actual work. That's what we do. We teach others. We connect to others. We are consciously working on healing that matrix, healing the humans, healing their psyche and upgrading. So I'm consciously doing the upgrade. So when I do my healing, I work on upgrade, not only on fixing the problems, I'm working on spiritual upgrades. It's it's more like subconscious, more like intention, because I don't really understand the mechanics of it. But I understand even just my intention to upgrade someone's uh, chakras or someone's uh, biofield or aura is sufficient, basically. When I say to someone, like we have a session, and it's very frequent, uh, I have a session, and I would, they would lay on the table and sit on a chair. I would put my hands on their head and do kind of um, Star Trek Vulcan mind melt, that kind of thing. And then I, my intention would be to upgrade, and I would share with them that I am working on your chakra upgrade. And they agree. So that is an important process they consent for the upgrade, and I petition for the upgrade. And the, then the rest is done by extraterrestrial and the, and the spirits. So there is a lot of extraterrestrial medicine going on. They help as much as they can. They especially help with upgrades, spiritual. And also they help with upgrades, genetic. So they are from their dimension, from their computer game. They have the advanced genomes which are more evolved for a while in that in that new software environment a new higher dimensional uh, system environment so they share their code with us and that upgrades the humanity in a genetic way so there is spiritual upgrade and there is a genetic upgrade so so the hybridization program is going on and um, we are very excited about it. Uh, There are many people who are scared because they are not aware and uh, in initial stages of this hybridization program were scary for for many, right, for abductees, but now we started the the, uh, voluntary, voluntary hybridization program. So if you want your your DNA to be upgraded, uh, you can write again to sign up to go at gmail.com and ask for um, for infusion of whatever species you like, Pleiadian, Liran, uh, Yael, Arcturian, uh, Syrian, and um, some people like reptilian. I'm not a big fan of that, but some people do. So we have reptilian uh, hybrids as well. And also you can apply for um, donating your genetic material to getting hybrid children up there. Uh, so there are, uh, there are humans up there. I'm sure I spoke to some of them. I, I'm aware of human settlements up there, permanent human settlements. There are, there are some humans that left 
in the Roman Empire times a couple thousand years ago, and um, they're telepathic. So genetically, we are compatible with telepathy. They are telepathic. They kind of when you live in the fourth dimension, the humans that live in the fourth dimension, they become telepathic, especially if they're born there and were brought up in their culture. They are telepathic, hundred percent telepathic. Uh, and psychic and so on. So it, genetically, we are compatible with the higher dimension. It's more like desire of the whole species to, to get there. So the hybridization program is going on, and now they are also much more advanced. They uh, understand much better how to to make the hybrids. The hybrids are born healthy. Their medicine is amazing. They can do upgrades on the fly, so the hybrid, if they want to change something, if the hybrid wants to change the skin color, or hair color, or eye color, or shape of the body, they can genetically upgrade. And by the way, it's funny, but uh, like the Pleiadian sister planet, it's called Era, it's uh, the start I get in Pleiades, um, the planet Era. The culture is very connected to us, they watch us as uh, entertainment and um, kind of uh, follow our culture. So their fashions are picking up on human fashions. There is that connection. So they have that environmental movement and they converted themselves to have green or blue skin so they can synthesize mm, uh, whatever sugars using uh, sunlight. So they are now green, but you know initially they are like other colored uh, people, but they just now have green and blue colors. That's that's a fashion. So um, so I'm very excited about this genetic hybridization, and it's um, it's important to understand it, and it's important to to work with the good guys, to with good ex friend extraterrestrials to to upgrade us and to get there. So that's my main, ex one of the main exciting things, uh, helping, helping, uh, helping us to evolve, helping the process, helping the first contact. I wrote a book about first contact for them. It's not very popular here. I mean, I sold maybe a hundred copies, uh, but but there they say a few million of extraterrestrials have read it, and it made made an impact. Basically, it was. A proposal, very rational, how they can help us to help the contact. You know, basically they want the contact, obviously, and uh, how can they help us to to educate ourselves, the humanity to educate ourselves? How do, can they help light workers to educate others uh, to basically bring the idea of positive contact, bring the idea of um, uh, it's like a, a, a country like whatever country, Bulgaria or Turkey being accepted in uh, European Union, right? So the, the Earth uh, has to desire that. The official representatives of the Earth have to apply for that. Then there would be some testing period. There would be some uh, conditions to meet. And then we will be allowed to, uh, to open our borders to the galactic community, which is all connected. So, So for me, it's like, obvious path of the progress. We, we have only one way forward and uh, we have wonderful helpers, wonderful spiritual helpers, which would help us to, to, to graduate there and become a community with open borders and uh, several self-governing community with open borders and basically graduate into the, uh, as Bashar names it, Homo Galacticus. Now we are <laughs> stuck on Earth, so we'll be allowed to exit, allowed to spread, allowed to integrate into galactic community. So that's an exciting idea. That is exciting. I, we're coming up to the edge of the of this show, so I just want you to, um, I want to ask you one question, but then we're going to probably, you probably only have time to answer it. If you say that they're doing these sort of infusion, genetic infusions for people that are requesting them. If someone were to have their DNA tested, would they be able to detect a sort of weird genetic anomaly that, say, wouldn't be in a uh, human who hasn't had this kind of upgrade? Is that something that can be tested scientifically and seen, or is it done on a spurt, or is it done on a dimensional level that isn't, you know? 
is there a difference between your spiritual DNA versus your physical DNA, and how would that be actually shown? Great question. Yes, there is spiritual DNA, there is physical DNA. They say they upgrade physical DNA, not in the whole body. Mostly they work on the brain, so they infuse stem cells, which gradually um, upgrade um, and infuse certain sequences into human DNA. Um, you see, there is so many hybrids already on Earth. Most of the humans carry Pleiadian, gray genes, uh, Liran genes, reptilian genes. So, so someone has to study that. Um, and we don't have this key answers. We don't have this key information. I guess, you know, if we had a sequence of Liran genome, Pleiadian genome, of course we could easily say, you know, there is that change. But uh, we don't have that. I, I have ideas what sequences would be most representative of Pleiadian genes. Uh, it's called ALUYA5. I think that would be most likely uh, Pleiadian infu infusion. But again, you know, different humans have different number of these sequences. So, so yes, our science can do that technically, but uh, there is no uh, knowledge, not sufficient knowledge. Um, I guess we could channel that. I, that's what my, would be my question to them. And so far, they give answers, but they're kind of vague. I guess, again, it's one of the answers which would shake the system, right? If we could trace who is a hybrid, would it be positive or not so positive? Mm, would you have, like, different kind of passports or something like driver license with a check mark that you are an alien hybrid? <laughs> well, that's a, very, that's a very good point. You know, in this, in this world, probably you would. People would want to identify everything, and, and they probably would want to know. Max, it's been interesting to talk to you. I have to have you back because we talked Thank about you. a lot of things, and maybe the next time we have you, we can pick one subject and really explore it because you have a vast amount of knowledge. It's really interesting to have this conversation. But I think you're right. They would want it on your passport. This is a such and such a hybrid, and depending, you know, and depending on the relationship with that race, they may, or may you know, look what look what they want to do with, uh, you know, our uh, friends uh, from some other countries. They want to identify them and do stuff like that, and uh, right. you know, we 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 don't get in that discussion. But anyway, right. <laughs> but uh, the, the website is humancolony.org. You can go there if you're interested in exploring uh, other worlds. Then send an email to I want to go or want to go or want how um, what is <laughs> sign up to go at gmail.com. It's a mail for them for the extraterrestrials and humancolony.org and YouTube. Just search for human colony or an abbreviation. Q Colo H U C O L O. And there are hundreds of videos from Hukalo, different channelings. Right. There's a webinar every Saturday from uh, 10 a.m. until probably 12 or 1. Yep. And, yep. excuse me, and with yes. sometimes with Jim Charles, sometimes with uh, Kim Louise, sometimes with myself and different channelers, and also Max, and just so many different people. Roxanne Swainhart's been on Human Colony, all kinds of different people. So definitely tune in. You can find them if you just type in Hukalo, just as uh, Max said, you will come up with them on YouTube. So Max, thank you once again. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and we, I hope to talk to you again very soon. Much thank love you to very you. much. Much thank love. You. Oh, they, Bob. Oh, I, it was it was excellent. It was egg. I'm, I'm sitting. I'm, did you hear me? Nope. <laughs> I mean, you didn't I'm, have. You were I, speechless. No, I, I was. I was so interested. Uh, I also have. Uh, there's Mark Brinkerhoff and at New York City, who's also been on the ships that Max mm. is talking about. I mean, wow. this would be, it would be interesting to get the two of them together. Yes, it would be. Let's yeah. do that. Very, very. It would really. I mean, in Central Park, Mark sat on a, on a park bench with one of these people. Wow. I mean, Let's have them both on together. Let's I'm, do that. I'm telling you, it is. It's wow. Mark, Max, I'm telling you, I'm 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 like just I'm blown away. I really am. It, it was it was great. It was really really good. Extremely informative. Nice. And the Palladians, well, by the way, they're they're my friends too, so don't worry about a thing. 
Well, we'll get the two of you together. We'll, you you get Mark and and I'll get Max, and we'll have a re- interesting conversation. We could do that. Yeah, we we may even go into a little overtime for that one. Awesome. Let's set it up. Okie doke. It's okay. Up. You guys. All right. You guys have like an awesome, awesome evening. You too, and much love to you. Much love. Now, everybody out there, now, what you just heard is real. This is real. Is this a real world? Hmm. I would think twice before you say yes. God bless y'all. Bob Charles.